Good morning, everybody. And thank you all for joining us here at ANU today and coming to our annual ANU Disaster Solutions event. The Disaster Solutions Update is bringing together experts, a minister, policymakers, students, industry, and the community to discuss how we will pay for the growing threat of disasters. Today, we will explore strategies to build resilience, prevention and recovery, and the role of communities, the private sector and the government. <clears throat> My name is Rosalind Princely. I am the head of disaster solutions at the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, otherwise known, otherwise known as ICEDS. At ICEDS, our goal is to advance solutions to provide innovative options to address climate change, the energy transition and the disasters. We facilitate integrated approaches across disciplines to research, teaching, engagement with policy, industry and the community. <clears throat> I would like first to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and pay our respects to the elders past and present and future. <clears throat> Before I introduce the Honourable Stephen Jones, I'd like to just make a little housekeeping note, two little housekeeping notes. The first is, please turn off your phone so they don't ring during people's talks. And the second is the bathroom is a real pain to find. And so if you follow <laughs> So that arrow and you go around to the left and the left again and then down the stairs on the left you'll get there it's not that hard it sounds pretty hard um, and so now I'd like to introduce um, the Honourable Stephen Jones MP. Stephen Jones is the federal member for Whitlam and he is the assistant treasurer and minister for financial services. Stephen was first elected to federal parliament in 2010 representing the southern Illawarra seat of Throsby. He was re-elected at the 2013 election and elected to the renamed seat of Whitlam in the 2016 election. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Wollongong and a Bachelor of Laws degree from Macquarie University. Prior to entering the federal parliament, Stephen worked as a community worker for various frontline disability services, youth and health services and as a lawyer with the ACTU and the Secretary of the Community and Public Sector Union. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. We're really looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thanks so much, uh, Professor Rosalind Priestley, for the kind introduction. I'm delighted to be with you here this morning. Um, let's start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. And as Rosalind said, let's celebrate their, their, their custodianship of country, uh, their wisdom, um, and uh, commit ourselves to the process of, of learning and reconciliation. I want to, of course, um, pass on uh, that note of respect to any First Nations people who've joined us in this conversation, whether here or from around the country, because I understand this is a hybrid event. People are uh, joining in online as well. Fantastic. Um, I want to note at the outset uh, that the work that I'm leading uh, on behalf of the government in the area of insurance is part of a whole of government effort in ensuring that we're better protected uh, against natural hazards and better able to respond when they occur. And in that note, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm the understudy this morning uh, for Brendan uh, Moonhill from the National Emergency Management Agency. And I know he's going to be addressing me uh, immediately, addressing you immediately after this. Um, and he's doing a fantastic uh, job as head of that agency in ensuring that we're better protected. Um, I also want to acknowledge, I see Andrew Halls here um, from uh, uh, the Insurance Council of Australia, an important partner with the government in ensuring that um, Australians are um, able to financially deal with the uh, challenges uh, of severe weather events. Um, good dialogue going on with the insurance industry, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my address. 
Uh, also see uh, uh, Rob Preston from Treasury here. I don't know whether you've got any other colleagues along with you. Uh, I want to acknowledge the important work that Treasury is doing um, in ensuring that we're well, ad well advised as, as ministers to ensure we get the best policy solutions uh, for Australians. Um, also acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Jenny McAllister, who was, is the newly appointed Minister for Emergency Management, who will continue the great work that uh, Murray Watt has done in the area of uh, emergency management on behalf of the government. Uh, the ministers for infrastructure, for housing, uh, and for industry also play critical roles. And I point this out because I want to just stress the uh, importance of the fact that uh, the challenges that we're facing and that this seminar is focusing on uh, requires a whole of government and a whole of government's uh, response. And each of these ministers are playing a critical role in how we deal with it as a, as a Commonwealth government. Our infrastructure investments, for example, have to be disaster informed. Uh, our building codes need to ensure that we're building homes that are resilient to severe weather events, and hence the Minister for Industry has a key role in that. Um, we've got to ensure that our investment in housing, the record investment the government is doing, the Commonwealth government is doing in the area of housing, doesn't repeat the mistakes of the past, whereby low-cost housing has been built in some of the areas exposed to the highest risks. But in the time that I've got with you this morning, uh, I want to talk about the important role that insurance plays in disaster preparedness and response. So in disaster management, we often talk about first responders. And government has a critical role to play in this. Our disaster management services of the Commonwealth, of state and local governments and our volunteer services and now well versed in the actions that are needed to take to move individuals out of harm's way, to fight fires, minimise the damage to life and property from storm and from flood. Those bodies are ably supplemented by the efforts of community organisations who in the immediate aftermath are feeding and housing and clothing uh, people whose lives have been destroyed or disrupted by natural disasters. But when the waters recede and the fires have been extinguished, there's a big job of rebuilding. And at its best, the insurance industry is the first economic responder to the destruction. Assessing the loss, ensuring money is available and the services necessary for the rebuild, particularly the private sector services necessary for the rebuild, are coordinated, trade services available, and the rebuild can commence. This is the very visible side of the role that the insurance industry plays in disaster recovery. Importantly, without insurance, these costs would fall upon individuals, on households, on businesses, and inevitably upon governments as the insurer of last resort. I also want to say something about the less visible function that's performed by insurance. Forgive me if I talk about these in frames familiar to any economists in the room. Insurance provides an important market signal of underlying risk in economic terms of where and how we're living. And as a grudge purchase, it's really seen in those terms, but the cost of an insurance contract provides an annual moment of an assessment for households, for businesses, even for governments on the value of their property, their possessions and the risk of loss and the means that they need to minimise any financial risk. Because there is an imbalance in the information that is going to be available to households and businesses about the nature, the probability of those risks and the costs associated with them, very rarely seen in these terms. Costs are going up, bills need to be paid, and insurance is something that too frequently is seen as a cost that can be shifted or mitigated, uh, something that uh, moves from a compulsory spend to discretionary spend as in Australians are increasingly attempting to make ends meet. Technically, we refer to that as underinsurance. 
Um, but in common parlance, it means individuals exposed to a big financial risk. It's why addressing, ins addressing insurance affordability and availability is a priority for our government. We want people to have the peace of mind that if something goes wrong, they're going to be okay. And when disaster sadly strikes and it's happening more frequently, people are going to be able to get back on their feet and get back on their feet quickly. When the worst hits, it takes its toll. No one is for a moment in uh, suggesting that insurance can fully address all of the emotional costs and the disruption or even the loss of sentimental values. But the cost of these impacts is, is even greater without insurance. So it's distressing to see insurance become increasingly out of risk for too many Australians. Insurance costs have risen by over 16% in the last year, and this is the biggest rise in 20 years. If you're a member of that industry, and in fact, a member of no industry wants to see its own byline in the quarterly CPI figures, and insurance is getting a byline in the quarterly CPI figures. The Actuaries Institute estimates that around 12% of Australian households are affordability stressed in relation to insurance. This means that they need to spend more than four weeks of gross annual income to purchase home insurance. Let that settle in. Four weeks of your gross annual income to pur purchase household insurance. There is a growing risk that households are just choosing not to insure or that they're underinsuring. This is particularly acute in low in disadvantaged communities and low income in communities. This is a cost borne by them, but it's also a cost borne by all as it places great pressure on public emergency management and recovery. And it's a serious challenge. It's a government it's a challenge that the government is committed to addressing on behalf of all of Australians and we're committed to getting it right. We talk at the moment about a perfect storm and perhaps all puns are intended of insurance unaffordability. It's important to note at the outset that Australia is not unique in facing into this challenge. In this regard, we're not an island unto ourselves. It's happening all around the world, particularly in our region. The problem is often presented in populist terms of one as one of price gouging. Greedy insurers pumping up their profit margins, gouging money out of uh, susceptible businesses and households. And it's always a very tempting discourse, particularly for people in jobs like mine to go down that path. Now, of course, the government won't tolerate uh, the exploitations of Australians, particularly Australians in vulnerable situations. So. We have asked and continue to ask our regulators to look very closely at pricing in the insurance market. And while we continue to keep a watchful eye on pricing, the risk of price gouging, price gouging just doesn't explain what's going on at the moment. It doesn't. It might be politically popular to describe it in those terms, but it just doesn't explain what's going on at the moment. Let's talk about the perfect storm, and it's a global phenomenon. There's three big drivers. First, we're exposed to a global reinsurance market. And for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of reinsurance, this is the insurance that underwriters uh, take out to spread the risks that they themselves bear as insurers um, in just about every category of insurance. Australian consumers are impacted by floods in France and chaos in California because we're connected to these global reinsurance markets. According to Swiss Re, one of the big reinsurers, global reinsurers, from 2017, the average annual insured losses from natural catastrophes totaled more than $110 billion US dollars, more than double the average of the previous five-year period. 
The 2022 floods in southeast Queensland and New South Wales were the second costliest insured event in the entire world that year. It was certainly one of Australia's costly ever events. The global, global increase in losses has driven higher insurance or reinsurance premiums for Australian consumers. This gets passed on to consumers and the Australian insurers are facing cost increases of between 20 and 30% just on that part of their cost base, the reinsurance contract. Reinsurance costs make up a significant proportion of the cost or the sticker price of a insurance contract that is paid by an Australian consumer. It can be as much as 30% of the price that an Australian insurer or an Australian insured play, pays for insuring their home or other parts of their um, values. So 30%, that cost is driven by global events, not just what's happening here in Australia. It simply costs more, and I guess the other thing to talk about, the second driver is the increase in the cost of building materials and labour. Put in simple terms, it's costing more to repair and to replace a home after a natural disaster. Just think about yourselves, if you've been involved in renovating your house, the quote you got and the final price that you paid, you're in the same market, you're experiencing the same phenomena. What it cost us four years ago and what it's costing us today to either build a house, renovate a house or repair a house is going up. The pandemic itself brought with it significant supply chain shortages and that elevated uh, demand for construction materials and for labour. So prices for materials have started to moderate in line with inflation, but labour constraints continue uh, to be high and continue to pr uh, present price pressures on insurance contracts, which means construction costs remain high and are being passed on to consumers. So all of that adds up and builds into the price of an insurance contract. Let me talk about the third driver, and I want to spend a bit of time on that today. It's the fact that we're still putting homes in harm's way. In many instances, planning frameworks allow people to build and then rebuild and then rebuild again the wrong house in the wrong place. There are more people and assets in Australia in hazard prone areas than ever before. It's true both here and in other comparable countries around the world, particularly in our region, which means when a disaster hits, the losses are much, much greater. And if disasters are occurring more regularly, then those costs are compounding. The force multiplier in all of this is climate change. And no one in our government is sticking our head in that proverbial bucket of sand over this. It's real, it's here, it's now, it's happening, it's not a future event and it's consequential. The impacts clearly aren't evenly distributed, but they are real and they are being felt now. In some of the most vulnerable households uh, that are experiencing the impact of climate change and severe weather events are in regional areas, in Northern Queensland, in the Northern Territory, Northern Rivers, parts of New South Wales. In these regions, they're having a greater exposure to natural hazards, particularly cyclones, uh, and flood and storm events. It's just a fact of life. There's also a socio-economic reality that can't be ignored. I've mentioned it a couple of times. I want to double down on it. Lower income households are more likely to be underinsured. They're more likely to be in harm's way and they're more likely to be underinsured. To be frank, Higher income households, and you'll know this yourself, are more likely to be built on the top of hills with nice views. And the lower income households are more likely to be at the bottom of the valley, closer to the river, in the area where peril is more likely to strike. More and more communities are being affected by the long, long tail of climate change. So as losses increase and more regions face higher risks of disaster, 
the cost of insurance is going up and it's coming. The full impact of climate change has not yet been baked into insurance. The letter delegation, Andrew Paul from the Insurance Council was uh, with me, took a group of our insurers up to meet with the global insurers uh, in Europe last September. They told me that the increase in premiums due to climate change is not yet being priced in, but it's coming. They said there is a cliff coming and it's in about five years time where the impact of climate change will become apparent and baked into insurance premiums, which is why we need to act. We need to act decisively and we need to act quickly. Action on insurance affordability can try to treat symptoms or can try to treat the cause. Frankly, regularly we've got to do a little bit of both. But insurance prices, as I've said, give you information about the estimated risk of a disaster event occurring. So from an economic point of view, you can try and mask that risk. This might look like subsidizing consumers for insurance costs. Um, so they don't feel the economic cost of that um, assessment of what it's going to cost to replace that particular asset, that house, that business, or the loss affected by severe weather event. So you can do that, or you can attempt to address the underlying risk. And that means investing heavily in mitigation and resilience. This is the approach that is both economically sensible, but it's also sustainable and fiscally prudent over the long term. And, why, and it's why that is the focus of the government. Risk mitigation means that we need to stop doing dumb things. We've got to stop doing dumb things. If we had our time over again, we wouldn't build houses in floodplains, but we have, and that's going to be a difficult egg to unscramble, and it can't be done quickly. But it does mean knowing what we know today, stop doing dumb things means that we need to stop building the wrong homes in the wrong places. And that's a message that all levels of government need to hear. Planning laws obviously sit with jurisdiction of the states and the territories. So we are working with our counterparts in those areas, but there can be no passing the buck. In 2022, the National Cabinet asked planning ministers to create a national standard for disaster and climate risk. And this is part of the reform process for land use planning and building. First ministers agreed that the days of developing on flood floodplains must end. That agreement needs to find its way into the practice, particularly around local government and consent authorities. Work is also underway to embed resilience as an objective of the National Construction Code. This will mandate that new homes be built to better withstand extreme weather conditions. But there's also an existing problem with homes that are already been built in perilous areas. And we need to build resilience there as well. The government's investing a billion dollars in resilience and mitigation projects through our new disaster ready fund. And I'm sure Brendan will have more to say about that during his presentation. This supports Australians to manage the impacts of disasters caused by climate change and other natural hazards. We've also established a new task force to examine how to minimise the impacts of disasters on the community and to address insurance affordability. Consistent with the comments I've made earlier, this will lead a whole of government approach to reducing risks that put communities in danger. Put a spotlight on the economic impacts of underinsurance so that we can identify near-term solutions to drive down insurance costs. The task force complements the work already underway through the Hazards Insurance Partnership, a partnership between government and the insurance industry, a collaborative effort which is designed to share data and intelligence. Why is that important? Because um, it's our view that insurance companies have some of the best data 
on localised uh, disaster risk in our country, in fact, around the world. We need to be able to utilise that data to ensure that where we are making public investments or where we are encouraging private investments, they are directed at reducing risk. Best bang for the buck. So there needs to be a shared understanding of the natural hazard risk and more informed mitigation investment. That's why the partnership with the insurance industry, utilising their data, their decades of knowledge is absolutely critical to this. The, housing, the Hazard Insurance Partnership has also been examining the relationship between disaster mitigation measures and the pricing of insurance. Because this is a really important two-way street. I hear the clear message from insurers that they want better mitigation efforts, and we agree. A billion dollars has already been set aside for the resilience through the Disaster Ready Fund community level projects, investing in community level projects to strengthen infrastructure and to protect communities. Billion dollars, it sounds like a lot. In infrastructure terms, it's not. That's why all of our investments uh, in the infrastructure portfolio and transport and elsewhere have to be disaster informed. Really important two-way street on this issue of, task, uh, of pricing. Um, Insurers need to recognise that risk reduction when action is taken by households or by government to improve resilience. The price signal's got to work both ways. Insurers can be quick to reflect risk in pricing. That's their business. I don't blame them for doing that. They also need to get better at reflecting mitigation measures, particularly micro mitigation levels that households put in place the businesses put in place or communities put in place in their prices. So we all know that when a household puts bars on their windows to protect their house from theft, that's reflected in the insurance premium. There needs to be an equivalent for households when they put in place micro mitigation measures at the household level, that should be reflected in the price of their insurance. It's a price incentive to encourage households to do the right thing. Again, at the community level, and all across government. There needs to be an incentive and a reward for households to invest in mitigation. The National Emergency Management Agency is doing an important job of work on behalf of the government to develop a knowledge base of household mitigation actions. These are actions that can be taken by households, the equivalent of you know, locks and bars mitigation measures that can be put in place by households that will reduce risk, that insurers agree will reduce risks and therefore can be passed on to consumers in the form of premium reductions, both locally with Australian insurers, but also globally by the reinsurers so that we can push down and keep a downward pressure on those insurance costs. This has to be the majority of the focus of the government. I want to return to that issue that I said a little while ago. Governments have got choices uh, in how they deal with insurance affordability. Uh, we can do what is often the very popular thing, in the way of subsidies, um, but the economic impact of that on the household might be short term, makes insurance a little bit more affordable over the short term sends the wrong signals about risk and how we mitigate the underlying risk that is driving the cost of insurance. And what is true at the household level is true at the community level, uh, true at the state level and true at the Commonwealth level. So the majority of the effort has to go into risk mitigation. We know that those investments um, can sometimes have a long tail on the return. So it might be necessary for us to explore other interventions as well. But overwhelmingly, this is where the government has to go. Um, masking the risk is not an enduring long-term solution. Dealing with the underlying risk is absolutely uh, the right way to go. Um, we helped in that path if the things that households do at a micro level is rewarded. Um, uh, so where they do put in place the mitigation measures, their insurance becomes a little bit more affordable. Not forgive, I'm not 
uh, suggesting for a moment that we pass the whole buck of this onto consumers. There is governmental action that is absolutely needed, um, but there are things that can, some simple things that consumers can do in their households uh, to reduce those risks. We want to work with households and with industries to encourage those actions. Stress again, the work that we're doing in the area of insurance and particularly insurance affordability is a part of a whole of government effort. The ministers that I've talked, uh, that I've referred to earlier, have a key role in all of this. Um, there is a public interest in us doing this. Um, insurance is the first economic responder after the water has receded and the fires have been extinguished. It plays an important role that government simply cannot replicate of joining up money that's available for the insured risk with the trades and services that are necessary to do the smallest and the largest of the rebuild effort. That's not something that government has the expertise or the ability, or the ability to do, and nor would anyone seriously want us to be doing that. So insurance plays an absolutely critical role as that economic first responder to a natural disaster. Therefore, there is an intense public interest that the government ensures that we can do everything possible to ensure that we reverse that trend of underinsurance. We stop doing the dumb things um, that we do have power to stop, which is building the wrong houses in the wrong places so that we don't make a bad situation even worse. We put the mitigation uh, investments where they're going to have the best return, whether they're community level, infrastructure level or household level, all needs to be done. Um, nobody um, is uh, under any illusion about the scale of the effort that needs to be put into place. Um, but what I do want to say uh, in relation to all of this is you get good public policy responses when you have sensible public debate. And that's got to be led by facts, robust understanding of what the drivers are, of the costs that are occurring here, always with the public interest in mind. And you get good public policy responses when you have good public policy uh, debate. And in that regard, we should resist at every measure the simplistic and the populist narratives which serve to disguise and ignore what the underlying risks and the underlying drivers are that are affecting households and businesses in every community across the country. So with those uh, very brief uh, opening remarks, I want to wish you all the very best for the symposium that you have today. It's an important conversation. You indeed are playing you know, a critical role in ensuring that we can have good public conversation, sensible public narrative, which can drive sensible public policy to deal with a problem, which I'm sure we all agree is impacting every household throughout the country. Thanks for that opportunity.